Okay, these are the major concepts that are going to be on the quiz, 2, 1 to 2, 3. So, the first type of problem, if x equals 8, then x should be squared, it just didn't show up, x squared equals 64. So the conclusion is the part that follows the then. So the conclusion is x squared equals 64. The converse is switching the conclusion and the hypothesis. So the converse is if x squared equals 64, then x equals 8. Next part, is the conditional and the converse both true? So first, let's look at the conditional statement. Number one, if x equals 8, then x squared equals 64. Yeah, that's true because 8 squared equals 64. So that's true. Now let's look at the converse. If x squared is equal to 64, then x equals 8. That's actually not true because x could also be negative 8. So that's false. Therefore, is the conditional and the converse both true? No, they're both not true. Since they're both not true, we can't write it as a biconditional. So if the conditional and its converse are both true, then you can combine to write as a biconditional statement. Okay, here's another conditional statement. If the absolute value of x equals 12, then x equals 12. Identify the conclusion. So the conclusion is after the then. So the conclusion is x equals 12. The converse is switch the hypothesis and conclusion. So the converse is if x equals 12, then the absolute value of x equals 12. So next part, is the conditional true? So let's go back to the conditional, part one. If the absolute value of x equals 12, then x equals 12. That's actually false, because if you solved this, then x could also be negative 12. So that's false. The converse, this part right here, is if x equals 12, then the absolute value of x equals 12. That's right, because the absolute value of 12 is equal to 12. So this is true. But it says, are they both true? So the answer is no, they're both not true. And again, if the conditional and its converse are both true, then you can combine to write as a biconditional. Remember to write a conditional, it needs to be a if, comma, then. So all third graders can tie their shoes. So if the person is in third grade, then they can tie their shoes. You could also write, if the person is a third grader, then they can tie their shoes. Or if the kid is in third grade, they can tie their shoes. Um, just something along the lines of that. Next one, every square is a rectangle. So if the shape or object or polygon is a square, then it's a rectangle. So you to write a conditional you need to change it to an if comma then. Next part, find a counterexample. So find something that makes the statement false. So what you need to do is you need to have something that satisfies the conditional. So this part needs to be true and then you need to make this part false. So you need to, for number one, you need to find something that if you have class in East 1. So we need to pick somebody that has class in East 1 and they are not in geom geometry. So somebody, so some class in East 1 that is not geometry could be Algebra 2 because Ms. Simpson teaches Algebra 2 in East 1. 
Um, and let's see. Miss Simpson also teaches algebra in East 1. Algebra 1. So those are the two classes that are in East 1, but not geometry. Number 2. If an animal is a bird, so we need to find an animal that is a bird that cannot fly. So think of a bird that can't fly. There's different examples, but the one that comes to mind is an ostrich. Or a chicken. Chickens can't fly, but they're considered birds. Okay, the next says we use the law of syllogism and detachment <coughs> to make a conclusion. So this is when we need to label our P's, Q's, and R's. So the first part, if Maria saves 4,000, we're going to let that be P, then she can buy a car. We're going to let that be Q. Maria has a car. That's going to be Q. So now we have P implies Q is true, and we know that Q is true. There's nothing that we can conclude that from that because it's still not the law of detachment. The law of detachment would be P implies Q and P is true. This one is P implies Q and Q is true. So we can't do anything. Next number, or the next one. If we host a birthday party, that's going to be P. Then we invite a lot of people over. That's going to be Q. If we invite a lot of people over, that's going to be Q. Then we buy pizza. That's new, so that's going to be R. Lucy had a birthday party. That's P. So we have P implies Q is true, the first sentence. Then we have Q implies R is true, it's the last sentence. So we can use the law of syllogism and say P implies R. Is true. And then we're given that P is true. So it's a combination of the law of syllogism combined with the law of detachment. So our conclusion can be if we host a birthday party, Lucy had a, then we buy pizza. Lucy had a birthday party at our house. So the answer is we buy pizza. That's the, that's the cue. Next one, if Zach runs repeat miles at practice, P, then he will win the cross-country meet, Q. Zach ran repeat miles at Monday's practice. That's P. So we're given that P implies Q is true, and then we're given P. So this is the law of detachment. So... If Zach runs repeat miles, then he'll win the cross-country meet. If Zach ran repeat miles at Monday's practice. So that means that Zach won or will win the cross-meet. Okay, next, draw a Venn diagram. So the Venn diagram looks like this, or it can look like this. Those are Venn diagrams. They show relationships between things. All Grand Rapids residents are Michigan residents. So first we can write it as a conditional statement. If a person is a resident of GR, Grand Rapids, then they live in Michigan. So to make this Venn diagram, what you're going to do is, it's going to look like this one right here. So you make a circle of being in Grand Rapids, and on the outside, you live in Michigan. So everybody that lives in Lansing, Michigan, or Grand Rapids lives in Michigan. And the last part, determine whether these are good definitions. Good definitions you can write as a biconditional. They're specific. They're not too vague. So the first one is a pig is an animal with hooves. So if the, if the animal is a pig, then it has hooves. And now I can write it the converse. If it has hooves, 
than it is a pig. This is not a good definition because we can't write it, write the converse. We can't reverse it. So it's not written as a biconditional. Because can you think of other animals that have hooves? I think of a cow. Cows have hooves, hooves so it doesn't work. Second one, a square is a four-sided polygon with four equal side lengths and right angles. Well, that seems specific enough, so now let's test the biconditional. If the polygon is a square, then the then it has four sides and four equal side lengths and four right angles. That's true. Now let's reverse it. If the polygon has four equal side lengths and four right angles, then the polygon is a square. That's true as well. Because we can flip them back and forth, yes, it's a good definition. We can write as a biconditional, and I said out loud what the biconditional is. And the last one, a bird is an animal that can fly. So the first statement is, if, if it is a bird, or if, I don't want to say if, but it, but if the animal is a bird, then it can fly. If it can fly, then the animal is a bird. We already said this was a bad definition. No, because chickens. Chickens can fly, so you can't say just because it's a bird it can fly. That's your definition. 